Uh, thanks for that introduction. Thanks for inviting me. Um, that was a great presentation by Glenn. I think that actually lends itself really well to what I, um, I'm going to hope to talk about here. Um, so I'm from the Center for Open Science, and I'm going to use this as an opportunity to talk about um, what we're trying to accomplish, um, who we are, um, and how this kind of segues into um, openness and reproducibility. Um, so the Center for Open Science is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we were only founded about three years ago. We have this broad mission statement to improve the openness, integrity, and reproducibility of scientific research. Um, and that's across discipline. Um, so definitely shooting for the stars, um, and we do this through a variety of approaches that I'm going to uh, discuss and highlight today. Um, and we're also, even though we've only been around three years, we've grown pretty rapidly. Right now we have about 70 um, people working in our office, um, and we're largely a technology company that I'll show at the end. Um, so a lot of these are young developers. Um, I think to start with, to kind of give you an idea of what, what we're trying to do here, um, is to discuss what uh, Merton des described back in 1942, which are the normative values of science. Um, so what you see here, I guess on your left, are the norms that he described, and then on the opposite there on the right are the counter norms. So things like open sharing, uh, you know, discussing everything that, we, that you find, um, and evaluating the research on its own merit, opposed to evaluating it on the reputation, like Len was just pointing out, of either the investigator, the journal, the institution. Um, the normal value would be being completely motivated, motivated by knowledge and discovery, the pursuit of the truth of what we're trying to understand, versus treating it like a competition, you know, pushing everybody else aside so that you yourself can get ahead. Um, and a big part of that is being uh, skeptic, a unit of your own work, right? Opposed to promoting your own career through theories and findings that you support, um, even if it's counter to that. So you can think of this very much as quality and quantity. So I bring this up because in 2007, Anderson and colleagues went to mid and early career NIH funded investigators and decided to ask them that question. Um, so they asked the first question, which is, what do you subscribe to? You know, do you believe in what Merton described back in 1942. And what you see here in the solid gray bar, that light gray bar, is that they believe that. They subscribe to these scientific normative values over the counter norms. Um, the hashtags are people that say, no, both of those are important in, in what I subscribe to. And Black says that I subscribe to these counter norms. Those are more important to me as a scientist. So basically, this is not surprising. This just means that Merton got it right and that we still believe it. Well, then they said, OK, well, forget about what you subscribe to. What do you actually do when yourself? What do you do in your own research? And you see a little bit of a shift. But generally, everybody still believes that they're operating under these normative values, that they believe in sharing and being completely disinterested in the results they have. You see a little bit of you know, recognizing that maybe some of those counter norms creep into their daily practice. Um, so then he said, all right, well, forget what you do. What about your colleagues down the hall? What does everybody around you do in your field? And it flipped. Right? Um, so this highlights to me two, two important things. One is we want to believe in these values, right? These scientific values are really important to us. Merton described that, and we still subscribe to that. But there's this disillusion going on between what we actually think we're doing and what everybody around us is doing, so what we actually are doing. Um, and this actually causes a bit of a problem, right? Because we're not even aware of the fact that we're not, not practicing the way that we think we are. And this actually presents a really big challenge. Well, so, so there's a couple barriers then that we talked about. So one is this perceived norms, right? Like, what do we actually perceive um, as these values? One of them is motivated reasoning. Um, so I kind of just hinted at that, which is it's very easy to sit there and say, oh, you know, I, I have to further my career, um, so I'm going to sit here and interpret and present my results in a certain manner so that way I can get ahead. And even if I don't think I'm doing that, even if I think I'm doing it, you know, purely from a, you know, sharing perspective, I'm unaware of it, right? Like as I just pointed out, I don't even know that I'm doing these behaviors. And so this creates a lot of bias that we're probably not even aware that we're doing as a scientific society. And then what's worst is that these biases are done, as Glenn just pointed out, in a context of minimal accountability. All you know from my lab is what I publish or don't publish in a given journal. So nobody's even holding us accountable to these biases that can creep into our daily practice. And we're not even probably aware that we're doing this in some, to some extent. What also makes this difficult is that these concrete rewards, publication, you know, grants, job placement, and promotion, those are concrete. Those dictate what I'm doing on a daily practice, opposed to these abstract principles, right? It's great to say, yes, let's share everything. Let's make sure that we're doing reproducible work. But those, those incentives are tangible, and those are going to dictate what I'm going to do on a daily basis. And of course, we're busy. 
I think that's one of the easiest things. Nobody wants to add more regula regulation onto what I'm doing. So it's very easy to agree with all of this and then dismiss it when you get back to what you're actually doing in the lab. So you can sum this up as the incentives are completely aligned towards individual success and getting a publication and not at all at getting it right. And so a lot of what we want to be able to do at the Center for Open Science is to align our scientific values with our actual scientific practices. So what are our ideals in the scientific um, sense? So basically we want innovative ideas, reproducible results, and we want to be able to accumulate knowledge, solid knowledge, so that when we're building on that, we're not sitting here um, and being skeptical um, of the work that, that that next level um, built on. Otherwise, it's just going to eventually crumble um, below us. And that really s fits on two uh, pillars, transparency and reproducibility. Um, so transparency is pretty straightforward, although we'll go into it a little bit, because transparency and openness are two separate things. Um, but reproducibility is a word that we throw around a lot. And there's a lot of different definitions of this. So I'm going to try to describe a little bit of how, um, how, how I, at least I view it. So there's computational reproducibility. So that means if you gave me your data and your code, I'd be able to rerun that and get the exact same numbers, graphs, everything that you presented in your paper, your report. Um, so this is, in some ways, the bare bone of reproducibility, right? This should be pretty easy. Um, surprisingly, this is, in some disciplines, horrible. Um, in economics, some people have tried to do this for published public data sets, and the success rate is less than 50%. 50% saying, I'll give you my script, I already know the data, and I cannot get the same results that you publish in your paper. There's empirical reproducibility. So do I have enough information from you, from your paper, to redo the same thing, right? So I'll redo the experiment, collect new data, but I just want to know, can I even get the information necessary to attempt that? And then if you can get all of this information, you should be able to, to then ask, is it replicable? Can I, if I do an independent experiment using the exact methods and analysis that you previously described, collecting new data, do I get the same statistical result? Do I get the same um, uh, you know, biological significant result. Um, but you can't even attempt to replicate something until you pass through those first two hurdles. And so why should we care? Well, I think that, you know, Glenn kind of pointed that really well, which is really we want to increase our own work and we want to be able to increase the knowledge that we're building on. And we can't even do that if we don't know what our reproducibility rates are. Um, so what are some of the problems? Um, so I'm going to try to highlight, I'm actually really glad that Glenn spoke before me because I'm going to try to highlight some of these other problems that I think you, you touched on a little bit. Um, and one of these is this flexibility that we have in the ways that we design and analyze our experiments. Um, selective reporting, uh, ignoring these nulls, and of course lack of replication. So one part of this is this researcher's degrees of freedom. Once I see data, or even before I see it, it's very easy for me to shift in the way that I'm going to analyze and interact with my data once it's known, right? Especially if I'm not stating a hypothesis beforehand. I collect some data, I'm saying, oh, it's very easy for me to rationalize that. Maybe I should exclude this, maybe I should collect more data, you know, maybe I should change my, de my dependent variable. Um, and, and obviously if we do that, that's going to lead to a really high rate of false positive, a really low reliability of the research that we're, we're publishing and conducting. And so then the question is, is this occurring and, and how does it look? Um, so if we look in the clinical space, um, this is a great um, organization. If you haven't gone, just go to comparetrials.org. Uh, ben Goldacre is leading this effort. And they're taking results that are published in the top five medical journals of clinical trials that were, they started doing this in October of last year till now. And they're comparing the results back to the, the registration of that trial. And they're asking, in this case, they've checked up to 67 trials. How many of them are reporting everything that they said that they were going to report in that registration, that clinical trials registration? Only nine of which are perfect, right? And, and when you look at these other ones, you start to see that 60% of them um, alter the specified outcomes, right? So sometimes you have outcomes that are not being reported, and sometimes you silently have outcomes that are being introduced that were never stated originally. And so to me, the big thing is we're not at all being transparent in, in why we did that. We're just doing that because that gets us the publication, that gets us the p-value that we want, and it gets us our incentives to move forward. Um, so if we look at power, here's another example of flexibility. Uh, so this was a study done in neuroscience. Um, so um, Burton Excel, they, they were looking at the median power, so the power of given studies in neuroscience. Um, and you can see here on the uh, x-axis, that's the power percentage, right? Um, and then n is the number of studies that they were looking at. So unequal distribution, so you do a median, you get about 21% power. So that means if you're detecting an effect that's true and it's accurately being estimated, 21 out of 100 times you'd expect to detect a statistically significant effect. 21 out of 100. So that would mean our literature should be just 
full of negative results, right? Well, if you look at the number of positive results in the literature, we don't see that. In neuroscience, it's 85%. 85% of the results being published are positive. Yet I just told you that 21% of the time we even have the possibility of detecting it. So this is a massive problem in the way that we're presenting our data. Um, and this isn't true just for neuroscience. Um, go right down the list, you can see more or less every, especially in the social sciences and the biological sciences, there's a lot of emphasis on positive, clean results opposed to the truth of what we're actually conducting and publishing. Well, there's more than just that, too. Um, we're disorganized, right? So if I actually go and I try to, <laughs> um, if I try to look and say, well, well what did you do, right? Um, how are we at describing the materials, the data that we collected? How are we at sharing that data um, and that materials? And how are we at you know, bringing it back when we need to go back and look at it, um, whether that's your future self or somebody else? Um, so people have started looking at this. Um, so the Resource Identification Initiative has, they published a paper back in 2013 looking at some key biological reagents and just saying, of the ones that are reported in the paper, how likely can I identify it? How likely can I tell you what vendor and catalog number it is? Right? So great, I have a MAP kinase antibody. There are thousands of them out there. That does not help me. Um, and you can see, with the exception of maybe knockdown reagents um, and the organism, we do a horrible job of describing what we even put in the literature, because there's no emphasis on that. that doesn't, that's not a hurdle to get the publication. It's the positive result. So we tend to shove this to the side. And I would actually argue that you can't even, like Glenn actually pointed out, you can't even interpret results without this information. Right? I can't accurately even interpret it, let alone try to replicate it. Well, then the, you know, the common thing would be like, well, just ask me. Just email the authors. The authors will tell you what they did. Well, people started looking at that. And basically what you find is that if you start to ask post-publication for the data or the materials that are used, it declines rapidly over time. And this is just, this is somebody's attempt just to look at the literature and say, hey, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, email that corresponding author and ask for this information. And a lot of the time it's gone. Um, and I can tell you from my own personal experience on the project in cancer biology, it's gone. And it's really amazing. And sometimes it's completely erased on a hard drive. So. This highlights some of the challenges, and so what are we doing as an organization at the Center for Open Science to address this? So we have this through four, four main objectives. Um, some evidence, there's a lot of organizations that have done a lot of work, a lot of great reports, and we're still ourselves trying to build evidence to encourage change. Um, hopefully, between what Glenn showed and what I just showed here a little bit, um, there's a good reason to have this type of change. Uh, we need to work with the incentive system, shift our incentives to embrace this change. Um, we need to train. People don't know how to do this. Um, so we need to start training on what does it mean to do re reproducible practices? What does it mean to have good statistical and methodological design? Um, and what we can do, which is amazing, here we are as scientists pushing the boundaries of what we know, yet we are fallen behind in the technology that we all use, but we don't incorporate into our research practices. Um, there is amazing technology out there that we could start to incorporate and try to have this occur in the background to make it easier. So we're also working to develop technology to enable this change. So this breaks off into our three main areas. Uh, so our meta science activities, community, and infrastructure. And so I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing in each one of those. So starting with meta science. Um, so we're, we are ourselves trying to do um, that ground level. What is the landscape look like? Um, so one of our big projects that we just published last year uh, in science, ironically, um, <laughs> Uh, that, was, that was very contentious with the group, but it is open access for this article, so that's good. Um, is trying to do direct applications in psychology. So this was an effort that Brian Nozick, our, our uh, co-founder, um, started uh, kind of organically, and it kind of turned itself into a more organized project. And the goal there was to say, all right, well, I'm going to take a given effect in a given study in a psychology paper. They picked one year, 2008, all the top journals. And they said, what happens if I try to detect that, do the exact same experiment as the original lab? So that means they actually talk to the original authors, right? Some back and forth. So it's even if it was, even if they said, no, 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 that's actually, even though that's what it said in my paper, this is what you should do, that's the design that they would agree upon. They would agree upon the design and the statistical test before they even embarked on this. Um, and the goal here, they did it over 100 times, but we only had 100 finish, was to get a huge sample set across the literature. So you probably have heard about this in, in, in NPR and a couple other news outlets, but things did not look very great. Um, if you look at one measure, p-values, you can see there that the original studies, 97% of the original studies had p-values less than 0.05. But when you did a direct replication, doing the same methodology, the same test as the original ones, 
only 37% 37% of the time did you get a statistically significant effect um, uh, effect based on a 0.05 cutoff. And it, when you try to dig into it a little bit farther, um, a big part of it is this effect size. Um, so effect size, right, is kind of the degree, and in some ways the effect size is more important than the p-value, right? A p-value does not actually indicate whether something is important or not, but the effect size, right, the toxic, the IC50 of a drug, that's the value that we're interested in. Um, that's actually where you started to see this. So this is a complicated graph. Each one of these dots replicates, replicates, uh, is, uh, represents an individual study. In green represents all of the ones that are statistically significant. Um, and you can see that the, there's the original effect size on the X and the replication effect size on the Y. Can you see my hair? No, you can't. Um, and so we, oh, there's a pointer. Uh, I'll just describe it. Um, so what you can see here is that on the Y axis in the, on the right side of your screens there, the replication effect sizes collapsed. They regressed all the way back. In fact, they went all the way back to the mean where they center right around zero, which basically means there's nothing going on right there. So everything's clustering. Instead of being this diagonal line where you have a, a direct replication in terms of the effect size, not the significance, everything's collapsing down um, underneath it. So essentially, you can have these small results that are underpowered, giving these inflated effect sizes that when you do a properly powered replication, so every replication was done with at least 80% power, everything collapses back down and the effect goes away. Not all the time, but the vast majority. So now we're taking this into cancer biology. Um, so we're trying to take that same model and bring it over now into preclinical cancer research. Uh, so, so in this one, we're doing this with the organization Science Exchange out in Palo Alto. Uh, so they're essentially, they are a marketplace of scientific um, uh, labs, uh, both academic and CROs, and we're using those labs to perform these independent drug replications. Um, and we're taking the same model. We're taking a subset of the literature. In this case, we picked papers that had high impact based on citation and uh, downloads readership so all metric scores as well, um, picked um, some of the uh, key experiments within that, and we're trying to do these direct replications. And we're doing this with the open access journal eLife. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about the process. So we start by taking these original papers and submitting a replication plan, essentially. Um, and I'm gonna describe this in a little more detail in terms of what this incentive uh, system is, and it's called a registered report. So we're essentially submitting what we plan to do. What, what are the materials that we're planning to do? What is the statistical test that we're gonna do? What's our sample size? And we're doing this all based on interacting with the original lab, or at least hopefully trying to interact with the original lab, so that we can do a, a con complete direct replication. Try to say, even if you maybe had flaws in your design, what if I try to do the exact same thing? Because if I can't replicate the exact same thing you did, even if maybe it wasn't controlled properly, that's a really large problem that we have. Um, and what happens is we submit these plans before we even begin any experimental work to eLife for peer review. Um, and the, the original author is in, invited there as well. We also have statisticians uh, at eLife that are invited as well to make sure that we ourselves are being held accountable to the statistical tests that we're doing, the assumptions that are being made, and the power of the test. Are we doing enough replicates? Are they independent? And is that gonna give us enough uh, um, sample size to detect the original point estimate, assuming that is true and accurately re, uh, detected? Then once that is accepted, that's when the experimentation starts then the labs will follow through. Um, and no matter what that result is, we're gonna publish those results in what's called a replication study. Uh, so you can see, here's an example of one of those, um, and the replication studies have not yet been submitted, and we're hoping in the next couple months that the first batch of those will be submitted. Um, and one thing that we will be doing in this um, is having all of our information behind it. Um, support it. So having, and I'll describe that in a second, some of the infrastructure they're having there, but besides having a single paper, it's also gonna allow us to show all of our methods, our lab notes, um, our, all of the raw data, um, every single thing that we collected in this process so that we can be transparent in that, um, in that measure as well. Uh, and I think one of the things that I hope to come from this project outside of learning from it is also to start to demonstrate a way that we can move forward and be transparent in our work. Um, without having to always have this emphasis on just that, that pretty result. One of the things that we're trying to figure out here as well is how do you measure replication? Um, so it's, it can sometimes be very difficult. Uh, statistical significance is one measure, but statistical significance does not necessarily mean that you replicated a result. Uh, so one thing that we're trying to do now is recruit participants. Actually, if you, well, any of you are cancer biologists yourself or you know cancer biologists, go to this site and register. And what we're gonna do is in between 
public acceptance and publication of these results is we're going to submit out surveys and actually ask the scientific community, what do they think? Do they think that we were able to replicate this original result or not? All right, so one of the things that I said that we're also working on in our community side is this incentives, right? Right now our incentives are all towards positive, clean results and not necessarily towards robust and reliable results. Um, so there's a handful of things that I'll describe that we're trying to work on in this space. Uh, one of these is called the um, uh, uh, top guidelines, so the transparency and openness um, guidelines. And so this is largely directed towards uh, journals, although um, this does apply to organizations and uh, uh, funders as well. Um, we've had a couple like Welcome Trust start to think about how they're going to integrate this. Um, this started at a meeting at uh, the Center for Open Science. Uh, ironically, again, this is also published in science. I think we publish a lot in science. It's not, it's, I just find that kind of uh, ironic a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, not, this number just changed. We now have 540 journals that have signed on um, and 58 different organizations. Um, and the principles, the, the concept of this is to have a kind of high level method of bringing policy chains at journals towards increasing a lot of the disclosure requirements that are necessary. So there are kind of a low barrier of entry. Um, you either aren't doing anything, you're having them disclose, require, or verify um, these eight different standards. I'll describe those in a second. Um, and this was also built to be agnostic to discipline. It's meant to be something that any journal in any discipline or subdiscipline can take, and it's up to that community to develop the standards that get applied. Uh, so the eight guidelines that are being described are anything from data citation down to trans design and uh, material and data transparency, um, as well as pre-registration of studies um, and analysis plans. So getting around this bias that can occur once you start to see your data or see your results, um, and as well as replication. Um, and if you guys were looking at science, you noticed that they just announced their um, policy on this. Uh, so Marsha uh, had an editorial just a couple of days ago, um, uh, basically advocating for other journals to do this and also stating where they sit. And again, they're a broad journal. Um, but this is, what, this is where they sit. Um, basically, they're only, allowing you, only looking for disclosure in certain areas, um, but requiring certain aspects of transparency and citation. The idea for this, one of the things that we're excited about with this is this can allow us to have journals take more ownership over what they have control of. They don't have control over their impact factor. They like to think that they do, but they don't, right? The papers that are being submitted, the investigators that are submitting those, that's where the control is. And so thus, there's a scramble towards making sure that you get these high impact papers. Even if they're not reliable, you want the splashy story. This is something that a journal does have control over, their policy. Um, so this, in theory, what we would love to see is a journal scorecard. This is how we should be rating our journals. What is the policies that you're implementing to increase the transparency and reliability of the results published in your work? And this also p allows you to start pushing them more towards stringent standard standards, because now it's publicly known and there's a path forward. So a lot of this was around sharing, and there's a lot of reasons why one would want to share. Obviously, journal funder mandates. Uh, increasing the impact of work. I don't think people actually appreciate this enough that sharing more of your raw data actually does increase, lead to more um, citation rates and more uptake of the research that you're working on. Um, but one of these things is actually just recognition of good practices. There are individuals in this community that want to show that they're doing good practice and there's no actually easy signal to, to recognize that. Um, so one of the things that we're working on with journals is something called badges. Um, that's what they look like. They're for different aspects and it's an easy indicator to make visible behaviors. Um, visible, um, these, these, sorry, these behaviors be, to be visible and to increase adoption rates. So essentially, one of the things that's nice is it, would, it allows you to instantly look at a paper without even having to read it, because this is something that is uh, checked by that journal and say, oh look, here's a paper that's made all their data publicly available. I don't even have to now look in the methods or try to hunt for it. There's a signal right there. There's this badge sitting on the paper that lets me know that they did something. Um, so then the question is, does it have an impact? Well, we investigated that in the journals, in the one journal that um, took this on early, uh, Psychological Science. So back in 2014, they adopted badges uh, as a possibility. Now again, this is not the journal saying you have to do this. This is a researcher submitting a paper and then applying for this badge after the fact. So it's kind of bottom up, not top down. Um, and what we saw was when you compared this to four other journals, that even though the data sharing rates were all of them around two, three percent, it shot up to almost 40% in a year and a half just by giving away a gold sticker. 
And I think it is, people like gold stickers. And I think this is a way to shift, because a lot of this is culture, right? A lot of this is trying to say, we as a community need to change the way that we do things. And one of the ways that we can do that is to reward those behaviors and to acknowledge when somebody's not doing it. So you can imagine this flipping to the point where we're just saying, why are you not doing this? Why are you not getting this? I don't trust your paper now because you're not. Like, why are you hiding data? And there are good reasons for it, but you should disclose that. So instead of having the default be private, the default should be public with exception. And this is kind of a way to start to create that community engagement on that. Well, there's also different types of research that go on, and so this can actually fall into um, uh, the way that we conduct our research. So, so you can kind of think of research in these two modes. There's this exploratory research, and there's this uh, confirmatory research. And, and, and we right now, those lines get blurred together. Um, and and I, don't, I don't actually don't even know how many researchers know that these, that these are two separate things, that you can't take the data that you use to generate a hypothesis and use that same data to justify that you have evidence of that, 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 that test. Um, and so what we need to do is create a better way of distinguishing when somebody is doing completely exploratory versus confirmatory work. Um, and one of the ways to do that, as clinical trials has kind of uh, showed us uh, a path for it, is registration, uh, what we call pre-registration. Uh, so it's to basically increase discoverability. I know now something exists. I know somebody's doing something. And there are exceptions to this, because um, you, you can still put uh, embargoes on that. Um, and it allows you to easily distinguish what did you explore versus what did you test, right? So if you're going to do your sample size, what was it based on? What are you coming to the table with? And what is your hypothesis and the way that you're going to design your experiment and test those results before you begin that work, before that bias that we all know can creep in, starts to creep in? Uh, so basically a way to kind of increase the reliability of the results. And maybe it does. It decreases the publishability. That is one thought some people are worried about. Um, so let's say, what happens when we do register? Well, we can, again, we can look back to clinical trials. So 2000, that's when registrations were required. Uh, so there was a great study done uh, just a short while ago looking at um, clinical trials from NHLB, so the National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute. And they said, well, what happens when we look at what occurred prior to registration in terms of the positive results? that were published versus after. And then we did large ones because you needed to be able to look back and knowing that a study existed. The smaller ones are hard to tell. They dropped, right? So now once, I hold, once I'm held accountable to what I'm supposed to do, I think reality sets in and then all of a sudden these rates drop. I don't, this is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. This means we're pushing things back to what we know. This allows us to accumulate proper knowledge, not, oh, we're not being as successful. Actually, this I think is being more successful in what we're doing. Uh, so this is naive to researchers, so we're going to try to help researchers. We're going to give them a small little carrot. Um, we, are, we have a pre-registration challenge where we're giving away um, $1,000 to 1,000 researchers to try pre-registration. Mm -hmm. Pre-register an experiment, and if you get it published in a journal, and, it's, and you actually s state your pre-registration beforehand, doesn't matter what the result is, right? That's the whole point. Uh, we'll give you $1,000. And this is a way to have people try something that they don't think applies to them. Something that I hinted at that takes pre-registration a little bit farther that's something that I really like a lot is a different funding model called registered reports. I already talked about registered reports. Um, so if we think of, in a very simplistic standpoint of how peer review occurs, peer review occurs after I've written my report, after I've collected my data, but before I make it publicly available in a publication. Well, at that point, anybody reviewing it is, all they, all they care about is the results, right? That, that, pub, that reviewer has a bias towards a clean story a, a, to their own interpretation of what the results should have been, not what they are, um, and not at all having the emphasis beyond, well, why did you ask this question? What about the methodology? What about the test that you're doing? So what Registry Reports does is it moves that peer review process earlier, right after the design, before you collect that data, right? Put out the best design you can that's possible. Actually, before you even do it, maybe you shouldn't even bother asking the question. And that's a good thing, right? We should maybe do less research because we can figure out before we do it whether it's worthwhile or not. Um, and so this lends itself very well to replication, um, but it actually lends itself to any confirmatory research that we're doing. And because that incentive of publication is already kind of almost taken off the table, right? This is working with the system. If you have an accepted registered report at this stage, you know you're going to get the results published as long as you follow through and you're transparent in what you're doing. So now that shifts the incentives to something that we have more control over. Um, and actually, we're also exploring, and we have some interest in this, and I think this would be great, is to tie this in with uh, funders as well. Funders, some funders, right, are, are doing in-depth analysis of grant proposals before they give that grant away. Why not couple that with journals, have that same high, high in-depth review occur, and then that way, when you fund the result, you can publish the result. 
So you're gonna have a really increased likelihood that those results are gonna become publicly available. And you're gonna end up having the best design possible before you embark on, on the research. Uh, so better use of our resources, um, while also getting around this issue of, of increased transparency of what one did. So there's a handful of journals that are trying this. Like I said, eLife is one that's working on it with the project. They're now figuring out if they wanna have this as a permanent option, but there's a bunch of other journals that are starting to do this as well. Um, we also do some training, I'll briefly talk about this, some training to enact change. Uh, so this is really hard for individuals. Um, so our funders realized that this was something that is, is lacking in the uh, institutional space, particularly. Uh, so we give away free statistical and methodological consultant. So we have some consultants on staff um, that basically go to give workshops, uh, can take email, can do one-on-one -on -one webinars to basically help somebody before they embark on, to basically talk about what does it mean to be reproducible and why are these issues important. Um, part of what makes this available is also um, making sure our materials are publicly available. So both what we do and as we work with other organizations within specific disciplines is trying to make sure that that content can get surfaced so that way more and more people can build on it so that way we can start to have this cultural change um, around these issues uh, opposed to just kind of having these select groups talk about them. And finally, we have technology to enable change. Um, so the way to think about, we, we tend to think a lot of uh, the way research is conducted in terms of the research life cycle. Uh, so right now, a lot of what we base everything on is just published report, which is the top slice of this circle. Yet we all know that we do everything and we, and we go, maybe it's round and round, maybe it's a spiral up. I mean, ideally it should be a spiral up um, of searching for it, developing that idea, you know, uh, collecting the materials, the data, the analysis, and we go round and round, but we don't expose any of our process. And there are some great tools that are out there that work for each one of those, but that workflow, that process from getting point A to point D, we have nothing that really helps us with that. So it's, not, it's more than just the access and the sharing and compliance, it's actually what's the process that we're doing research in. Um, so this is a quick so schematic overview of kind of what our developers are doing at the Center for Open Science. Um, so they have something that we're calling an open source application suite. This is basically the back end of what almost everybody wants when they're trying to think about this space, um, which is workflow, authentication, file storage, file rendering, having a database to store everything, uh, have it integrate with other services, have it be searchable, um, and, have it inter and basically have it so that others can detect what, what are these research events. Um, and these apply to different things, and I'll show you a couple examples. Um, one of them is OSF.io. So this is kind of our forward-facing approach on having a collaborative, uh, essentially scholarly commons for researchers. It's free to use, it's open source, um, and we're already starting to connect with other services that are out there and different aspects of the workflow. So this is what we currently connect to a lot of different storage devices, so it allows you still to operate, the researcher to operate the way that they want to, but allows it to start to bridge more of that together. Um, we have integration grants to start tying in more and more of this process and we want to have more and more developers in the community build tools on top of this because once you, once you tie into this network, you get access to everything else and it makes it a lot easier. So essentially, it's a public good that we can all build on. Um, another example that we are working on right now is preprints. Uh, so this has been it's a great AS, uh, ASAP bio meeting that came out of HHMI not that long ago in terms of uh, biology and having preprints. Bioarchive's a great resource for that. Um, there's a lot of communities that, that don't have that. Actually, I don't know if, oops, sorry. I don't know if your community has that or not. Um, but we're basically making it so that if you want to have one, it's very easy to do that because we already have the back end built and all you have to do is figure out how you want it to look. Uh, same thing for meetings, uh, trying to work with organizations on increasing the content, the talks, the posters that they give, uh, making it very easy for these small steps towards data sharing and being able to build on those results. Not that just be a static result, but something that you can interact with and build on, um, as well as building registries for groups. So this is uh, um, an organization that does time sharing experiments in the social sciences. We basically have a registry for all of their experiments now. Very easy for us to do because the back end infrastructure is there and now this ties into everything else and has more accessibility. Um, and Glenn brought up a little bit with institutions, we're starting to now work with institutions as well. Make it so that institutions themselves can have a better means of sharing data within those institutions, maybe not with the broader community quite yet, but make it easier to share and for those researchers to connect to those institutional tools like a repository or any other access that they have. So that way they can start to have these principles become more mainstream without having to develop something new. They can still do what they're trying to do, meet, basically meet them exactly where they are, but bring these principles along for the ride. And that's where I'm going to end. And actually, in, in speaking of that, if you want my presentation, you can go here and download it and view it yourself. Uh, so thanks for the time. Um, I'll take any questions.
That's exactly, yeah. So pre-registration has two forms. So you can say design pre-registration, uh, which is, I think that, that's the most one that I resonate the most with, which is what are your endpoints? Uh, what's your sample size? How are you, if, if it's a clinical trial, right? How are you enrolling? How are you excluding? Um, all, these, these apply to everything, right? They, they, maybe there's different flavors in different communities, but it's the same thing. In fact, I, I would argue it's everything that Glenn just said. That's all pre-registration. Everything, what are your controls? Make sure that those controls are there. What are you using as your controls? How are you gonna like, interpret your data before you collect your data? Um, you can also apply it just to analysis. Um, so there's some, obviously some groups like economics, you're not gonna go out there and like recreate data sets. I'm not gonna like recreate the Great Depression or the Great Recession, um, right? So that data set is known, but the way that I explore that data set in terms of testing a hypothesis, I need to define that. Cause you know, there's a lot of ways I can like interpret that data. And if I only show you the one time that I get a p-value of less than 0.05, that's not really te saying that I've tested something. So, so it has those two flavors. And essentially it's a, the, and true, uh, true sense of what pre-registration is, it's just a time snap. It's saying, this is what I'm intending to do before I do it, versus registered reports, which actually takes that to a second level of having it be peer-reviewed beforehand. So actually have outside input come into it. Absolutely. Ex exactly, and that's, that's all it is. It's meant to say, here's the line. I, this is what I intended to do. Oh wow, it's not at all what I thought. This is what I decided to do. But you're absolutely right, now you're and, it's, and it goes back again, and round and round. And it's basically, this is the scientific process. It's just, we're just maybe not doing it as well. Maybe we need to, to we're the easiest ones to fool. So this is a way to stop fooling ourselves. Excellent presentation. Um, much of what we've discussed this morning is focused on publication, but there's also a whole other set of implications on patents. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. has recently switched from first to invent to first to file. So two questions. One, does that provide an incentive to rush to file based on data? And then secondly, mm -hmm. what are the implications of a principle that's... A, a, a finding that's in principle correct, even if the publication is not supportable based on the statistical approach. In other words, if you file and you're correct on the principle, but your data don't actually support it statistically, what's the impact on patent law and the patent filing? I'm, I'm not a patent attorney. I can't answer that question. I mean, I, it, it raises some good points in this. I don't think this. I think this, like you were saying, I think it intersects fairly well in the sense of trying to um, hit, just hit this disclosure statement early, but I, I have no idea actually how this is, was, is gonna impact it. It's like I'm not in this space. Most of the world does operate under first to file. Mm -hmm. And the US was first to invent, so you had to prove that you were the first to invent, which depended on the quality of your invention, right. as opposed to first to file. And it strikes me that that puts the incentive to rush to file. Right as opposed to prove you're the first to invent, which seems to have many of the same incentives built in to the publish in the high profile journal. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, it's a good point. I mean, I, I honestly wish I could comment more on it. I just, this is a bit outside of my space, so. Mm. I think that's a feasible uh, path forward. Right, so that's a good question. Um, so the badge, com the badge community is actually enormous. Uh, badges, obviously, if any of you have like a Fitbit, right? Fitbit gives you badges, so it's all over the place. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that giving out these little badges are really important. Um, we have a badge committee that you, you can pose the question to. There's a committee around these badges that we have. Um, I think what we've done with organizations in terms of doing this is the top guidelines actually lend themselves a lot better. Um, and like I said, we've been working with uh, 
funders and different organizations in the sense of, because there it's not so much of like, here's a credential. We're not trying to be a, a, some credential-based group. We're trying to help foster organizations to do the best job that they can. And so top guidelines, I think, are a better fit because then you can sit there and say, this is what our policy is as an organization. This is what we are doing. Um, and this is how we have a path forward. Um, so that actually, and you have complete control over that. And it's, and it's really, it's a surfacing that and providing a guidelines towards how you do that. So I think that's gonna be something that will essentially, it'll still look like a badge, it's numbers, but it, that I think is a better fit. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I too really liked your presentation. Thanks. Um, reflecting on what we heard from you and also earlier from Glenn, um, and, and also I'm thinking of a conversation we had over the, the break, um, it's, it's, it's evident, it seems to me that this is a very constructive <coughs> step in the right direction and, and to bring peer review forward, for example, to mm -hmm. the study design stage, get the study design right, um, get a peer review of methodology as well, um, prospectively, mm -hmm. ideally. Right. Um, and of course, uh, the, the final step of uh, applying rigor in the presentation and interpretation of results, which I think Glenn would also agree with. But the one thing that's missing here is blinding. And, and uh, how, 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 do you, how do you feel is the relative importance of that? Is that something which is fundamental <coughs> and until we do that, we're always going to have uh, flawed studies, or can we make real progress? Is this the path forward that's going to uh, get us to uh, more reliable and reproducible uh, and credible science? That's good. Uh, I would argue pre-registration uh, in many studies requires blinding. If, okay. if, if, that, if, that's, if that's what your discipline or, or area of expertise requires at that stage, you should do it. Um, and I think all that does is it makes sure that you're doing it earlier on. So I think blinding and that's for the community to group. That's for, for that individual technique and subcommunity, because it doesn't make sense all the time. Um, but, but yeah, no point, I don't think blinding is, just because I didn't mention the word doesn't mean that it's not something that's part of it. For instance, with the reproducibility project in cancer biology, every time it's relevant, anytime there's a subjective moment, right, counting something, uh, interpretation of something, uh, you, we put down blinding. And that's actually something that we, that we get checked on by our reviewers to make sure that we are indeed sometimes even stating how that process is going to occur. Randomization is the same thing. We don't actually talk, you didn't bring up randomization. Randomization is incredibly important, uh, especially in animal studies, to really make sure that you have that. And whenever you are presenting your data, if you're not actually presenting all of the baseline data behind it, and if your randomization is really poor, then you could have misleading results just based on that. But that all goes into the, to the design, which is actually why I think pre-registration and registry reports is wonderful. because that's for the community to make sure that they're enforcing themselves on it and they're being transparent in that before they embark. So your answer implies that you think that blinding could be uh, discipline specific? You're using the terms... Uh, oh, I'm using that because like, it just doesn't, it doesn't apply for some, for some types of techniques or for certain disciplines to have blinding. So it's like, I don't think blinding in all of psychological science makes sense. There's certain types of studies that they do that doesn't make sense. And, and there's some biological studies where, you know, it's good to be blinded from like the outcome, but like if you're doing things that are completely uh, automated, where it's collective base, right? It's going to be a little different. But then there's other things that you have to make sure that you're you're conscious of. Um, so I think all this is making you do as a researcher in this community is say, well, are we are we asking the best question, and are we doing it the best way that we can before we s expend our resources on it? Thanks. This isn't really a question, it's just okay. sort of more a comment to the audience as a whole, because I'm sitting here listening to this, and I think that uh, what's really struck me is how HESI operates, and I can say this because I work for HESI, and I love HESI, and HESI's fabulous, um, but when, as committees, we work on science like this, I'm, I'm speaking really from my experience with the ring trial that Kelly talked about yesterday, or some of the genomics work on the cardio, car, the pre-cardiac safety work. We operate as a, com as a committee that's working to really talk about the experimental design, the statistical analysis, the hypothesis. And so it's, it's sort of this pre-work that's happening within kind of the collaborative nature of HESI. So I just thought it was an interesting thing to bring up that, not that everything we do is perfect and wonderful, but I think a lot of the ways that HESI and groups like this operate lend themselves to this kind of transparency that we're talking about. Yeah, and I think to follow, like, I think it'd be great to try to surface that more. So that type of behavior is really important to demonstrate and, and even to expose as much as you can of that process. 
um, because that's a big part of what kind of drives research forward um, versus just those outcomes that that are in they are important, but there's so much that we do that don't that don't make it there. Maybe it's ninety percent um, that we should share as a as a community. Could I just ask you about the uh, peer review process, where you shifted it from the peer review pre-publication to pre -re peer review of study design? Yeah. Are you suggesting we don't peer review the results, or do we peer review both? Mm. Well, okay, so I'll answer that two ways. So one is, this is just another model. It doesn't replace what we have. So I think, especially if you're doing, if you're, if you're gonna say everything I did is exploratory, then yeah, let's just, let's, just, let's just peer review the results because there's nothing to worry about up front. And then you should be held to the rigor that you should at that stage. And then what we propose at Mercury Reports is peer review at both stages. So, and then the peer review at the second stage, it's not about the outcome. It's about, did you follow through with what you said you were going to do? And then, well, we all know it's science. If you deviated, were you transparent and justified in that deviation? So we do have it at both stages there. So a comment on the, the pre-registration or early peer review, I think, as you've already talked about, this is going to take a huge culture shift. In, in Absolutely. Industry. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's a big, I mean, even for my own grad work, I've got lots of results that, that I would love to actually share with groups, and my PI won't, he just never wanted to share those. And um, that's a shame because it's negative to us, but that's very, very valuable for that community. So you're right, it's a big thing. And in, actually getting back to the, in terms of IP aspects of it, this would be great for you guys to engage with us on this. This is, you're absolutely right, we need to tackle this, and we've been taking this very much from that academic lens but, but we should definitely, and we invite that to have, if any of you are interested in that, you can contact me afterwards, is to figure out how can we get this to work in a model um, that fits in with uh, those type of regulations. Um, that, that's good. It's, you know, I actually think training trumps peer review. I, th I think if, the thing that's funny about peer review is even, even if you shift it, we as a community, if we're not aware of the changes or how to address those changes and we're essentially self-watching ourselves, we're not doing anything. And that's actually why I get a little nervous about that, the new NIH guidelines. I think they're wonderful, but I already have talked with a lot of investigators that they're like, we don't know what to do. So that's kind of s s scary to hear that, but it's also, we don't know what to do but we're also the ones to review others. So it's like the blind leading the blind to some extent. Um, and so I actually think there needs to be more training done. Um, and I actually think that trumps almost everything. Because, um, but I do think that you know, having more emphasis be on these earlier steps is probably healthy because we are actually, we are in good scientists, we want to do the right thing. And I think when we're presented with methodology, we can sit there and critique that without bias a lot easier. There's still gonna be bias there. You know, oh, maybe you should use my technology or my approach. But that's gonna be a lot easier than just the results, which I think are just so, we're just, we're humans. We're just so easy to say, I'm gonna give you a clean story with just these positive results. And I think peer review is because it's a human enterprise is flawed as a result of that by human um, biases. Last Is there a peer reviewer from that business line to critique it? 
And, and the other example is in <coughs> So I remember when I was doing my PhD <coughs> work in publishing it, my major professor <coughs> steered me away from certain journals which had already published similar work because he was concerned that, you know, the, the publishers of that similar work would be the reviewers mm -hmm. and that they could hold on, you know, um, delay the review, they could be doing parallel work that they want to publish first. You know, so there should be some kind of controls for that sort of thing. Yeah. So I think the the steps for how to like kind of how to peer review essentially is is exactly kind of what tops geared towards. Um, what are and this is actually why I think it narrows down to almost it's technique based for many things, which is for these types of techniques, what are the considerations that you need to have at that? And again, verify, require, you know, um, sorry, uh, I already forgot them. Anyways. But it, I was like, verify is not the first one, it's the last one. Uh, <laughs> right, disclose, uh, require, verify. You can do those same principles, right? So, and again, it's not perfect. Look what nature has tried. Nature essentially has that. It, it, it is because it's cultural, it's going to take a while. But I think that's where, and we're trying to engage communities on coming and saying, why don't you come together and discuss how this works and then give that back? Because I think actually journals want to do this. They don't even know what to do, right? They don't know how to, how to create these guidelines. And it's actually not for them to create. It's for the community to, to essentially agree upon and then for them to essentially regulate. Um, and then what was, sorry, you mentioned something. I was going to say one more thing uh, on your second point. Mm, I forget. I'll come back. I'll, I'll, I'll remember, then I'll come chat with you. This is the really, 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 really last one. Just, just a comment. <laughs> As a regulator, uh, we have to be assured that all the data that, that companies provide us for uh, a marketing authorization for pharmaceuticals are that we can trust them. So we have uh, GLP and all that type of stuff. Um, this type of pharmacological and, and proof of concept uh, elements are not in that type of GLP uh, phenomenon. But I uh, should we believe that 90% of all the data are untrustful, cannot be reproduced. Uh, I have the feeling that, that we should uh, be more um, uh, or be less impressed. Of, of course we have to be careful and we have to peer review. But I have the feeling that if we look at a, at a dossier, uh, a full dossier, it has to be consistent. The one with another uh, publication. So if we have five publications on an anxiolytic drug, my, uh, my, my first uh, 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 type of scientific work, it should be a consistent phenomenon. And, and it might be that some individual papers are not very trustful, but at least if you have a, 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 a consistent pattern in your responses, that might be help. The, the medical ethical committees to trust the, um, the, the proof of concept. And, and the, the, the same is true for toxicity. If there you, that's why we ask for so many studies to, to have a consistent pattern if there is no consistency. And in, in a lot of cases, there is a lot of consistency. So reproduction of this reproducibility in, in the science is, is higher than um, yeah, I believe from this type of presentations. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. I think variance is a good is a very important thing to embrace. That actually gets back to your first slide that you brought up. It's a beautiful thing. All the individual studies, you can't take one at face value. You've got to take the whole thing, and, and that variance is actually important. Also, I remembered real quick last month. Preprints is a way to get around those biases. I, I think preprints are great. Uh, I think the biology community. Talk about learning from other disciplines. Physics is wonderful with preprints. Archive, really, nobody really kind of worries about those issues that we worry about. I think preprints is a way to get around some of those biases that can occur in terms of where you submit. Uh, thank you a lot, everyone. <laughs>